My guest today is Mike Shelton. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great, David. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. I want to provide our viewers a little bit of context here. Mike and I work together on the same team, and uh, he is the data guy, especially the cloud data guy. Whenever I have questions about data in Azure, Mike is the guy that I talk to. So I, I don't throw out the world expert lightly, but I think it applies in this case in this, uh, in this topic. Well, too kind. Very kind of you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you're you're working with something that uh, I'm not really familiar with at all, uh, a uh, a data lake house, and I think uh, and I've heard of a, a data warehouse. Is that similar? Yeah. So basically, a data lake house is uh, conceptually a pattern for applying a data architecture, and you can think of it as a combination of a data warehouse and a data lake. Okay. So if we start with the data warehouse, which came first, and a little bit of a background about a data warehouse. Um, you can think of a data warehouse as providing uh, analytic and reporting solutions for customers, businesses, or what have you. And really, the the original idea, or one of the original ideas of a data warehouse, was to offload data from your transactional systems. So right. you have a transactional system, an application. Let's say it's an e-commerce application taking in data taking in orders and you want to do reporting or analytics on the business you would often move that data from that database or that system into another system that uh, was a data where is a data warehouse and the data warehouse was uh typically done with a relational database and had structure applied to it so you would define the schema for the data warehouse, and that required you to understand what your business reporting needs were going to be or what you need them to be. So you would define this schema, and then you would go through a process uh, that's referred to as ETL or extract transformation and load. And the idea is you would take the data from your source systems, extract it from there, transform it as appropriate, maybe clean the data, and then load it into the relational database that was your data warehouse. And that was great, and it provided uh, very ease of access to uh, the business users for reporting and analytics because it was modeled in such a way that it made it easy to do these reports or do right. this analysis on the data. And uh, which is great, you know, still used today was uh, a lot of application over the years, but uh, over time uh, it started to uh, show its age a little bit. I guess is one way of saying it where as data volume started to grow, it became potentially difficult to scale the systems. So often a data warehouse is in a single machine, single database server, and then technology uh, was uh, evolved into doing what we call MPP or massively parallel processing, which allowed you to scale a data warehouse uh, in, in a parallel fashion. But as new data types started coming in, uh, beyond uh, structured data that fit a data warehouse very nicely, uh, a new technology came in uh, referred to as a data lake. What do you mean by new data types? Uh, it could be uh, te like text data types, uh, you know, so social media data types, could be images, videos, um, other things that, that didn't really fit that structured construct of a relational data schema uh, very nicely. Is that yeah. nice rectangular table structure that I'm, I grew up with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all familiar with, right? Very comfortable with. So um, again, a data warehouse has a lot of value, still today has a lot of value, but this data lake concept came in and was very often deployed with Hadoop technology. And what a data lake or what Hadoop technology brought to uh, the data warehousing, reporting and analytics scenario was uh, it was a file system based approach and it was a distributed file system with a distributed compute layer. And what it allowed you to do was to load the data without having to have the schema defined ahead of time. So if you think of a data warehouse, you have a set schema that you would load from your transactional application. Well, if you didn't have say the column or the attributes in your data warehouse already defined, when you extracted or wished to extract it from your source system, it, it didn't have a place to go, so you wouldn't use that data. 
So now a data lake without any structure to it allowed you to uh, load all of the data in this raw format, in this file format. And then later you would apply the different levels of uh, transformation or depending on what the uses were. So you could load it initially without knowing how you would want to use the data. Okay, so it sounds like the data lake has addressed the limitations of a data warehouse, uh, but apparently that wasn't enough. We needed something more. Well, yeah, because the thing with the data lake is since there's no structure, it wasn't very easy for business users to just go after that data. And um, some people may even use the term a data swamp when you think <laughs> of this data landing here without any uh, uses, any use cases, no structure. So then we start to apply structure. So then organizations may have a data lake for this raw data and then go through an ETL or what was uh, some people refer to as an, an ELT where it's extract, load and transform and okay. still would use a data warehouse. So now you potentially were duplicating data between these two systems, a data lake and a data warehouse. You would still have to do some transformation to make it available. A data warehouse being delivered mostly in a relational database system of some sort provided query processing, query acceleration, uh, and all of these things that have been in relational databases for years. Uh, you didn't really have that level of query capability in a data lake. Right. You'd have Hadoop with MapReduce, so you could do processing on the data but wasn't always super performant when it came to querying from a business user perspective. Uh, I see. And that's what the lake house adds to yeah, it, right? Exactly. So Databricks sort of coined or, or evolved the term of a lake house. And the general idea of a lake house is to bring the benefits of a data lake and, and what that brought along with the benefits of a data warehouse, but trying to minimize the potential uh, disadvantages of each of these platforms and bring it together into a single uh, platform, if you will, or single set of technology to be able to deliver both. So you can bring in that raw data into an object store and have that then transform, but still a single representation of that data, let's say, and then accessible to a variety of different compute engines within that single platform, depending on what your use cases might be. Well, give me an example, example of some of these cases. Yeah, so some examples would be your standard reporting and analytics, your uh, say like Power BI reports or data visualization and these sorts of scenarios. But some newer scenarios that um, were becoming more interesting and important for businesses would be machine learning or artificial intelligence, where you might want to do some sort of uh, machine learning with semantic modeling on top of that raw text data, let's say, or being able to do uh, image recognition with some of that data you might bring in. So now you have a single data platform that allows you to do a variety of these scenarios, uh, depending on what the business would need. I'm curious about the architecture of this. This is uh, because a, a data lake, typically that raw data is, is saved in its raw, its raw format. So you might have Oh, I don't know, some relational data over here, some uh, some blob files over here, some mm -hmm. uh, JSON documents over there. Um, and uh, and yet the data, the lake house actually puts a schema on top of that, or does it load it somewhere else into a format that has a schema? I, I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on that process. Yeah, and I would say at this point, I mean, this is certainly a growing and emerging area. So there's a, a variety of technology options that, uh, people have to apply this, but in as a in general, or maybe I'll generalize a little bit, what may be a common pattern is you would load the raw data and it could be coming in in whatever format it originally was. So it could be right. JSON, CSV, or what have you. And then that would be, uh, there's a couple of different terms that might be used, but I'll use this idea of bronze, silver, and gold, uh, which is a common uh, pattern or common idea, and you load this raw data into what you might call a bronze layer. And this is often deployed in uh, the file system uh, ideas where you would have folder structures to uh, uh, manage your data and so on, but you bring this data into the bronze tier, we'll call it. 
And then in this file system, then you would have some sort of compute. So as I mentioned a minute ago, you can have a variety of different compute engines. So a Spark, Apache Spark is a very common compute engine that you could use in a, a lake house. Um, SQL constructs are very common that you would use in a lake house. So let's say you might use uh, some Spark uh, compute, maybe Python or uh, uh, some SQL code to transform that data and you might store it into a different format. So a common format would be Parquet. And okay. Parquet is a column oriented and compressed file format. So the idea is you would sort of go through this process of, of cleaning the data and arranging it in such a way that it makes it easier for folks to consume. So you might have this curated data in say this silver tier, which would be maybe another set of, of folders or another area in the object store to store that data. And then you continue through that process maybe to make it, refine it a little bit more into something that would be used for reporting and analytics into the gold tier. And then again, maybe a different compute for query at the end of that process. So that's typically how you would move it through or an example of moving it through that process. Got it. So we are actually making copies of the, of the data, or at least the relevant copies, the copies that are relevant to our clients, and we're transforming those into a format that makes it easy to report on or build machine mm -hmm. learning models, whatever, whatever uh, is closest to what our consuming client needs. Mm -hmm. So that means that with, as we're building these data lakes, we need to think about what's the final use of that data is going to be, right? Absolutely. You're right. So, and you would typically have those requirements as you would with a data warehouse today. You have that fixed schema at the end. Some of that data may go there. But to your point around the duplication or you're still copying data, you're sort of think of it as maybe manufacturing or refining the data. So as it goes okay. through, you have a, a bulk of data comes in mm -hmm. and then you sort of refine that and then you're going to get more of a refined set of data and each step of the way through that process it's going to get refined a little bit more so you may not take all of the data that you originally loaded in that raw zone and move it through to the end state but what's one of the benefits would be since you have all the data there if you have a new requirement or a new need, maybe there's a new attribute that you need for reporting, rather than having to go back to the transactional system to extract that data, you already have it. And now it's just adding it to your refinement process in order to make it available for business users. I see. Can you talk a little bit about the tooling that you use as you're working with Lakehouse? Yeah, and one of the interesting things with the Lakehouse is, uh, I mean, the cloud really provides some real advantage when you think about how uh, you can do this on a consumption basis. You can bring in a variety of different uh, tools or scenarios, but um, my familiarization is with uh, Microsoft Azure. So if you think of that, you would use a capability we call Azure Data Lake Store as the object store repository. You would load that uh, raw data in, curate that. We have, um, a capability we call Azure Synapse Analytics, which has a Spark engine that you could use for that data transformation. It has a variety of, of SQL engines. So there's a serverless SQL engine for that query. There's a dedicated pool, depending on what your needs are. So those are some of the tools that you would have. Uh, Databricks is a, a popular Spark engine that we have in Azure as well that you could use uh, against the same data. So really the benefit is you could choose to use Databricks for some data processing. You can choose to use Azure Synapse for data processing or maybe the serving capabilities as well. So those are some of the common tools that I'm familiar with for building a lake house. Excellent. Um, where would people go to learn more about this? Well, we have a variety of, of great resources. Microsoft Learn, there's there's free courses out there to learn about um, Azure Synapse and applying these various different capabilities along with as with Spark and, and that scenario. So I would start there. The Microsoft Docs pages, the documentation pages have got great resources. Uh, we have architectural patterns to how you would uh, build these sorts of environments or deploy these sort of environments as well. So those are great places to start. Excellent. Is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is essential to this topic? Well, I, as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, it's an emerging area. It's it's constantly evolving and growing. And I think there's, you know, 
there's great uh, areas of ex exploration. Um, you can grow into this environment incrementally. So I think it's um, it's it's a great way of evolving your analytics platform. Gives you a lot of flexibility, and uh, some of the resources I mentioned are great great places to start. Mike, I've learned a lot in the last few minutes. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, David. It's a pleasure, and it's always great to talk about technology with friends. So thanks for the conversation and look forward to more in the future.